Hello, I'm Karen Golden Arante at Living, Hist Living Histories at the Historical Society, downtown Cohasset. This morning, I am with Pat McCarthy, who is here as a lifelong, uh, you've been resident in Cohasset for lifelong. You were born in Cohasset. Um, as a matter of fact, you were born at the Cohasset Hospital. Yes. Right here, which was on Sawyer Street and Ripley Road. Sawyer and Ripley at the intersection, yeah, 1943. So now your, your mom was here. Your My mother was from Cohasset. My yeah. grandparents came from Ireland and uh, they established the homestead on Dolan Lane on North Main Street. So uh, my mother grew up here. My mother taught school at the high school. She taught uh, typing and accounting. And after I was born, she went back and she was the secretary to Mr. Ripley at the high school because uh, when I, w I was born, my dad never saw me till I was three years old because uh, he went into the Navy in World War II. And at that time, when he did that, we moved back with my grandmother on North Main Street. And my mother went to the school to, w to work while he was in the service. So he came home, uh, I was three years old. Um, it was really something during World War II not to see your parents, but my, my relatives kept me quite busy. <laughs> so <laughs> now at your grandparents' home, they had a lot of animals. That yes, you they did. Well, that's where I uh, got my love of uh, horses. My grandfather uh, raised foxhounds, hunted them in Wheelwright Park. We had goats, chickens, and big garden and that type of thing. And uh, at that time, I really developed a love for horses, which uh, later in life became a big part of my life. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So you went to you went to school here at the the Ripley Road. For, well, the the elementary school was the Osgood right. School. We went right to Ripley started Road. out in kindergarten there and we went to the sixth grade Yeah. at uh, Ripley Road, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, my first teacher was uh, uh, my kindergarten teacher and she lived where St. Anthony's Church is today. Ah, okay. And uh, so that was quite an experience. Of course, all the teachers knew my mother, so they kept pretty good tabs on me. Yeah. Um, we were just talking about one the other day uh, she was a gym teacher at the school. Her name was Miss Ayers. Uh, her relatives, one of them is a doc orthopedic surgeon in South Shore Hospital now, Fred Ayers. But uh, Miss Ayers always came to our house at Christmas time and we had a real nice friendship. So uh, from there we went to the high school in the seventh grade. So now sports was a big part of your life growing yes, up Yes, they were. And uh, um, one thing we had, we, they started a, a little league team here in Coasset when I was eight or nine years old. And the first two years we played at Milligan Field. And then the Barnes family donated the land on uh, North Main Street where the little league field is now. And uh, one thing that I really remember is that for two or three Saturdays, all the kids and their fathers all reported to the field with rakes and shovels, and we raked the field off, fertilized it, planted it, and then we had uh, our little league field up there for the last two years. We could play until we were 13. So now before we get to the high school, I, I just wanted to talk a bit about um, when your dad returned yeah. and and what Cohasset offered for the returning vets because looking for housing here was certainly in the top of their list. Originally when my parents got married before I was born they lived in Atlantic, Atlantic I think it's Atlantica, it's part of Quincy uh -huh. in an apartment but then my dad went and he was in a, an apprentice uh, program at Charlestown Navy Yard but then when he got called into the service, as I said before, my mother moved back to Cohasset. So I'm sure when my dad came home, they wanted to stay in Cohasset, and uh, they were very fortunate. The town had set aside 
land up next to the high school where today there's Clay Spring, I grew up on Bayberry, Tapello, and Arrowwood. Those th four streets were all house lots for veterans, and if you served in World War II, you could buy a house lot for $100, which my parents did, and uh, we were one of the first families to build there on Bayberry Lane, and I think I know we were one of the first families to move in. We moved in on Christmas of 49 into the uh, house up there. Yeah, and then most of the families moved in in 1950, I think. Yeah, 50. So. And at that time, Arrowwood Road wasn't even, uh, wasn't even made. So when I lived there, the, net, the last road was Arrowwood. And uh, once they got a rough road down through there, I'm just thinking now, uh, there was one particular house lot and that uh, on 4th of July they'd have a big cookout for the neighborhood and my dad would put lights up and all and we'd have uh, uh, a 4th of July, uh, what is it called, baby carriage parade with bicycles. <laughs> and, but it was really a, a, a very homey neighborhood if I could say it that way. Uh, today we have, uh, there's only one I'm thinking one, two people left from the original. From the Veterans Project. Yeah, Johnny Mello is one, and uh, Leo Fiore, who moved, he built his house on DiPello, but he moved up to Schofield Road after a while. But there's no other people that originally built the houses that still live there. Yeah. Well, one of the stipulations is if, if uh, drawing, literally drawing your name out of a hat to yeah. then choose a lot was that you needed to build your home within a year. Yes, that's and right. And there was this, this article in the newspaper, which, um, which we'll show up close here, showing you helping your dad as a very young boy here, yeah, well, building, the, building your home. He yeah. built your home. Yes, he did. He yeah. built, all, the fella, all the men up there did, did, built their own homes. Yeah. Uh, names people would be familiar with, like Cliff v. Dixon, who was at the Yacht Club for years. He lived behind me. Um, people like that on weekends, that type of thing. My dad would have a bunch of friends down from the Navy Yard in Charlestown on a weekend to board the house in or whatever. Um, that's how we built it. And of course he wired it. And uh, then, and then as I say, we moved in on Christmas Eve, um, 1949, yeah. So now that meant that you could walk to school. Yes. <laughs> yes. I didn't so, have much choice. Right. So, so <laughs> Cohasset High School, at that, just to show people what the high school looked, uh, looked like at that point in time, prior to um, certainly the renovation. And, and really, you, you were close to downtown, so it could really meander around with yeah. all of your friends. Yeah. Um, just to show an example of what of what the main street looked like yeah, at that point Yeah, that's downtown time. right there. Yeah. yeah, that picture is 1955, I think. Yeah, <laughs> but some of the stores, well, majority of them aren't there anymore. Mm. You don't see many Desoto dealers out there today. No, no, not at all. <laughs> and and Delory Drug actually yeah. burnt down, so now yeah. we have a empty the lot vacant beside. Vacant lot there. Right? Yeah. Yeah, and the first national was next door, mm -hmm. and Danny Campbell, and then Pilgrim Bank, and then the hardware store. And uh, Elizabeth Bristol was right in here somewhere, as I recall, yeah. yeah. So, now the, um, one of the things that you were very involved with in, in, foot, in um, high school was football. Yes. Um, the, actually, didn't they lost like four years in a row at one point? Was that before Evie Dore came in? Yes, he, yeah, that was before 57. Yeah. They had a, uh, a team. But in 1957, I was a freshman, and I was a part of the undefeated football team in 1957. Um, that's the best I think they'd ever done here, but it was a real good team. So, uh, and I played the four years in high school. And that was Evie Dore, the coach e for all of yeah, those Mr. years? Yeah, Mr. Dore was my coach all those four years in high school, yes. 
and and he was a promising football player himself. Very prominent. And he, he here again, talking about World War II, he was a standout at Boston University, for, I'm going to say for two years. And then he went into the Marines in World War II, and he was wounded. And so when he came home, uh, he still wanted to play football at BU, so they made him a kicker. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, was, uh, uh, he was just a tremendous man. I, have the most most respect for him. Yep. So this is the um, the football team from 1960. That's my senior year, yeah. and we were champions of our league in 1960. Yeah, that team there. And you were all scholastic. That was it. Your senior year, you were all scholastic. Yes, yeah, senior senior year, I was all scholastic center. Yeah. And now your sons followed in your footsteps there. Yeah, Sean Patrick, my oldest son. This is an article that was in the ledger. My oldest boy was made all scholastic, and I forget the year, but uh, the, artic the whole article was about very few father and sons had made all scholastic uh, during their careers. So it was quite an honor for me. Yes. So I just wanted to point out, Pat, a few things that I thought were, well, here you are in, here you are in your oh, yeah. football uniform, yeah. and, and, and here we have your senior picture. Senior class picture, that's right. Yeah, but I thought this was so appropriate, I actually chuckled when I saw this, because it is so appropriate, Mr. Personality here, um, from the class of 61. Yes, yeah. I was voted best yeah. personality, yeah. <laughs> and that is Margie Kingsland, who was in my class. Yeah, who I uh, she's a professor at University of Missouri now. Yeah, very nice kid. Yeah. So now, when you graduated, um, after you graduated uh, uh, high school, you went up to the Marine. Maine Merchant Marine, Marine Academy Marine. in Castine, Maine. Yeah. Yeah. So, and you're, you still continued to play football. Yes, I played four years at Maine also. Yeah. And you're, the area of your uh, interest at the university? I was a marine engineer. I took engineering at the academy. Yeah. 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 Um, and then after you graduated, then you went on to the yeah, C2 we cargo ships. Yeah, went to... Uh, um, a classmate of mine from Cohasset, John Winters, who later became the harbor master here in Cohasset. He was my roommate at Maine Maritime, and then we went to work together at W.R. Grace and Company in New York City. And uh, uh, when I graduated on a Saturday, Sunday we flew to New York, and uh, we went on a ship in Todd Shipyard, and it was the C-2. And at that time, the shipping companies were, I guess I'll have to say, leasing their ships to the government for the Vietnam uh, era to carry cargo uh, from the United States into Vietnam. And that's what John Moose and I did uh, together on a, on a C-2. The, the name was the Santa Inez. So, uh, yeah, we had quite a... The fir first trip we ever made was out of, we went to Todd Shipyard in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, I always remember this. Moose and I went through the gate and went to the pier, and I looked up and I said, Moose, we're going to be in charge of that engine room in two hours. And he said, well, I'm scared. I said, I'm scared. Or, uh, <laughs> we both, we, we made out very well, and uh, we left Todd Shipyard. For, and this, as I said before, this was our first ship to sea, going to sea, and we went right around the world. We went from Todd Shipyard to Europe through the Suez Canal, down to the Red Sea, through the Red Sea into uh, Bangkok, Thailand. We fueled there, and from there we went on to Da Nang, uh, Vietnam, to offload the cargo. At that time, we had just general cargo on that trip. Then when we were unloaded, we left there and came back to Oakland, California. So we almost went around the world the first trip that we made. After that, I was running uh, ammunition from Sunny Point, North Carolina to Cameron Bay and Da Nang. 
that that route we took down the east coast through the Panama Canal and to Bangkok and then to Vietnam. So you must have felt that sitting in a boat with ammunition must have been a little scary when you got there. Yes, it was. I guess we always uh, originally when we went in there, they had the Vietnamese unload the ship. Well. <laughs> One day, all of a sudden, I hear a fire in the cargo hole, and somebody had lit a fire down there with the ammunition. And so with that, the government said, no more of that. So then we anchored out, and the Army would come and take the ammunition as they needed it. So a couple of times, I was sitting right in uh, Cameron Bay for a month until they used up all the ammunition, then we'd go back and get another load. Now, how long did it take? Your vo how, what was the length of your voyage from the States? It was, uh, it, t usually three to four months. Yeah. Usually. Then we'd have a couple of days off. I, I think I made three or four trips like that. And then I was fortunate enough to, uh, Graceline sent me to school in Sun Shipyard in Pennsylvania. Uh, they were building six semi-automated ships. And it was all new technology, and uh, I was on the second one that was uh, built. It was called the Santa Barbara. And matter of fact, Moose was on there with me, um, but we went, both went to school down there together. So that was a great opportunity to help me, you know, develop what I had done, what I did for the rest of my life. But uh, yeah, that's that was that's how they did it. That, that ship, I would leave Port Newark, go all the way through the Panama Canal to Valparaiso, Chile. And I think we used to hit about 30 ports on the west coast of uh, South America. It was a 55-day run, and I'd come back to Port Newark, jump over the fence, jump on the airplane, come home for a day, and then run back and make another 55 days. So we'd serve we'd work two trips and have the third off. So it worked out pretty well. And during that time period, I did get married, so. Now, you, there was a, you had told me about a famous beer run at one point in time in your life. Did you, did you oh, well, the, how, your beer run to meet your future wife, beer, Alice? You, did you go, how did you meet Alice? Oh, how did I meet Alice? I'm gonna get killed now, but anyway. <laughs> uh, we have a very good friend, um, that I grew up with. Bonnie Doherty was her maiden name. It's Delay now. But when she graduated college, she and three other girls got an apartment on Beacon Hill. <clears throat> so, of course, Moose and I and Bernie, being at Maine Maritime, Bernie Mulcahy, uh, we had to jump in the car and come on down to Beacon Hill. So, uh, uh, we were kind of hanging out there on weekends and stuff, a little partying and so forth. So. One night, this girl was sitting in a chair, and I had to go out for beer. And uh, I kind of looked at her, and I said, Hi, I'm Pat. And uh, she said, Well, I'm Alice. I said, Well, I'm quite busy now because I'm going for a beer run. But when I get caught up with everything, I think I'll marry you, <laughs> and, which I did. Oh. It was, uh, it, yeah, that's our it picture. It is the wedding picture. Yeah. Pat and Alice. That's awesome. Great story. Yeah, it is. Matter of fact, we were just in Boston last night um, to, to Mass General, and uh, we went across the street. I, f I think it's called the Harvard Gardens, and I hadn't been there in 50 years, and uh, we had a little reminiscing uh, back then of being there, yeah. So now it, it, when you retired from uh, the ships, you you got very involved with the high school. Well, your boys were here and yeah. all scholastic, and so um, you got I was very one involved of the, with the president of the Gridiron, right? Yes, I was one of the founding members of the Gridiron Club. Yeah, and uh, it was a, a real good group of peop men that we uh, we started it. And uh, as you know, your father helped us uh, quite a bit with our ad book and so forth. And that picture there is. Uh, we, Walter Sweeney, who grew up with us, he played for the San Diego Chargers, and I think I'm right in saying 10 or 12 years as a guard. He was retiring, so when he played the Patriots in Schaefer Stadium, we had a Walter Sweeney day. And uh, <laughs> I'm just thinking now, looking at the 
the picture we had drawn of them. At halftime, they had us go out on the field. So Walter's standing there beside me, and I don't know if you remember, but back at Schaefer Stadium, I think it was either Dodge or Ford used to drive their cars on the field and around advertising. So we're standing there, and Walter goes, Pat, you didn't get me a car. I said, Christmas? No, Sweeney, you're not worth it. So as it turns out, we gave him that picture there of uh, we had painted. I think it was done by the fellow that used to draw the cartoons in the, Patri uh, in the ledger, but I'm not sure. But that's uh, Clark Chatterton, myself, Mr. Mr. Dorr, as you mentioned, and Buddy, yeah. Clark was a very active member, as most people in Goasset know today. Right. So yes, I was uh, quite active in the in the Gridiron Club. So when you finished the um, when you finished with the, your boys have all had all graduated, <laughs> and you went back to one of your favorite. Clubs. Yes, I call this my bucket list. Uh -huh. All my life, I wanted to train racehorses. Well, when you get married, have children, and you have a job, you don't. Um, and matter of fact, I, I got this from my uncle who did train racehorses, uh, and I always wanted to do it. And I, uh, I was at the racetrack with him, and I, said, I was a senior in high school, and I said, Jimmy, I'm gonna get my trainer's license. Well, he ran and called my mother and said, you come and get them right now because I'm not going home to our mother and say, well, Pat's going to train horses because I was the first one in our family to go to college. So with that, I had to go to college. And so I always uh, used to, my wife will tell you, any uh, vacation we went on, it was to a racetrack. But anyway, um, as I say, it was part of my bucket list. And uh, so when my kids were out of almost out of college, I think, and my wife was teaching here in Coasset. Um, I was with a small firm, and it was in the late 90s when the economy went down the tube, so I just, and I had, I at that time, owned a couple of racehorses. I said, the heck with it, I'm going to the racetrack, which I did, and um, I'm very happy I did. Um, uh, around the racetrack, uh, as Karen knows, um, they did a couple of articles on me because somebody would say, well, what did you used to do? And if I, I said I worked in nuclear power plants, people would scratch their head and say, what the heck are you doing here? But um, I just loved horses and uh, I'm awful glad that I did it. And you had success in your, in your horses. Yeah, we, we ran, won quite a few races. I, have, uh, I was lucky. I, you know, my famous statement in the... Uh, in the newspaper articles was that when I was in engineering going all over the world to nuclear power plants, I was overweight, had high blood pressure and everything. I say, now I lost 50 pounds, but I'm broke. So you don't get rich training racehorses, but I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. So one of the things that you also did, which is how we connected as well, you volunteered with the Senior Center and you still volunteer today which is amazing, Mr. Personality. Everybody <laughs> loves, loves. Um, Pat is very, very personable, and the seniors love um, yeah, being we, with you. Well, uh, I've kind of branched out now. Um, it started out at the senior center. People needed to go someplace that the van didn't take them. And uh, that uh, they said, hey, Pat, would you mind taking Mrs. So-and-so? No, nah, that's okay. Well, uh, at this point today, I have probably 10 or 15 people that uh, call and say they have to go to the doctors in Boston or Brookline, or I have one tomorrow to go to Plymouth. So uh, that's basically what I did, uh, what I do today. And um, I'd like to just add to that, I have another part-time job and I'm in charge of global marketing for Goodwin Graphics. <laughs> and uh, Ronnie said to make sure I put that in here. <laughs> but that's a very high-powered job, you know. <laughs> yes, it is. It very is. stressful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now you have to tell us the phenomenal trip that you went on this spring, which oh, is really okay. wonderful. This trip, uh, I call it the McCarthy Last Hurrah. And I took uh, 
my whole family, my grandchildren, everybody, uh, we went to Ireland. Um, I have a, a little saying that goes along with it. Um, most people realize when you die, you probate your will. Well, my philosophy is when I probate mine, the balance will be zero and nobody will get in a fight over a dish. So um, we went to, all went to Ireland. And just recently, my grandchildren have completed a round of, uh, all three of them jumped in Cameron Bay. And now all three of them, my oldest grandson just came down this summer. And all three of them have jumped off Mill Bridge. So I consider that a quite a acclimate for those three grandchildren. Yeah, around. yeah, that's a cohesive thing. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. You have to do it. I did it once. Yeah. I didn't bring that picture. I didn't think I was ever coming up when I jumped <laughs> off that bridge. <laughs> well, Pat, it's been a treat to talk to you. I've, I've really enjoyed actually learning more and more about you, which has really uh -oh. been fun, Mr. Personality okay. that you are. <laughs> and thank you for coming down this morning. My pleasure, as always. Thank you very much for watching Living Histories. Bye-bye.